Okay, I think it's already time to start our lecture. So I welcome everyone on our eighth lecture of our astrochemical um, lecture course. This lecture will be given by Professor Paola Caselli from Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. She will speak about From Atoms to the Seeds of Life, the Astrochemical Survey. So, Paola, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sergi. And uh, I uh, would like to thank everybody for joining uh, today. So I um, I hope you are hearing me well. Uh, so I just uh, start my lecture. So this is uh, going to be, um, uh, looks like a little bit, uh, say, uh, too much going from atoms to seeds of life. So I'll do my best to say summarize uh, um, things as much as possible. And then of course, if you have questions at the end, you can ask me. So in this first slide, uh, you see uh, the type of tour that we are going to do today. So we will start from, uh, uh, say, molecular clouds to we will get, then go inside these molecular clouds uh, where stars form. So this is a young star. You have probably have seen uh, this beautiful image from the JWST. And then uh, within uh, this little region here, is this is where the uh, protostars and protoplanetary disk will form. And of course, within the protoplanetary disk, like this beautiful disk that was observed with the ALMA, we can see structures that looks like rings that uh, probably are carved by uh, planetesimals or planets. And in fact, here we also see uh, evidence, uh, um, say, of uh, formation now, actually, of, uh, of planets. But uh, these are also the regions where primitive material, uh, uh, like, like uh, small bodies or, say, planetesimals, are, uh, are formed. And here there is an example of comets uh, in, uh, in our solar system. And then, of course, uh, this planetesimal will feed onto planets. And uh, forming, uh, uh, for example, terrestrial planets like our Earth. And here you can see, in fact, uh, a, a picture of our Earth with a DNA molecule that it's, uh, say, I put it there just because it's a beautiful molecule, but not just for that, also because the molecules of this uh, uh, DNA, we will see that uh, pieces of that are actually uh, seen or uh, say found in primitive material in our solar system and precursors of molecules to these prebiotic uh, uh, molecules are found in the interstellar medium. So molecules are super important because, of course, we need to observe them during this uh, uh, journey from clouds uh, to planets to understand how the chemical complexi complexity increases. But also they are important as astrophysical tools because with the, the measurements of their lines, we know their frequencies uh, with high precision, we can then, uh, say, uh, measure the uh, frequency as it changes within uh, within a cloud and then uh, or a disk and then from here we can deduce uh, for example if there are motions uh, if there are uh, uh, certain physical conditions that can uh, produce uh, these lines so la uh, molecules are really fundamental to understand the physical properties the chemical processes and also the dynamics so then we can link all together these various steps and uh, understand our astrochemical origins so uh, before going into the say chemistry i just wanted to uh, you to um, uh, say show something. So this is uh, a piece of our Milky Way. So this is the Milky Way as seen in the optical, just to give you an uh, say idea of the size of our Milky Way, and also to show you where these molecules come from. So you can see here that in these pictures, you see dark lanes. These are the uh, lanes and the structures that in fact uh, are containing molecular uh, clouds and where molecules are, uh, are forming. 
together with stars and planets. And in fact, if we switch wavelength and go to, uh, say, millimeter regime, and in, in particular, this is the regime of the CO120 transition, you see that uh, the, where it was dark, it is now bright. This is, the, in fact, the map done uh, in a uh, long time ago, in 2001, of our galaxy. So is it using molecules allow us uh, to actually penetrate these very dark regions? They are dark, of course, because they contain dust and gas, so gas first of all, and then dust with the mass to gas dust ratio that is, uh, say, um, say gas to dust mass ratios of 100. So we have uh, here uh, to, um, so these dust grains that are sub-micrometer in size can actually absorb the light coming from the background stars, and that's why we see them uh, dark. Uh, so we really need the molecules to penetrate inside these uh, regions. And this is, for example, a, a very famous example. You can see here uh, the, from the 12C160 uh, map that is shown in, uh, uh, in this map of the metal in 2001. If you want to go deeper inside, you need actually to use rarer molecules or rare isotopologues in this, in this particular case, the 13 CO, to uh, make sure that you can see structures of the cloud because with the 12C, 16O line, the 1 to 0 is so optically thick that you are only able to see the skin of the cloud. Then these colored dots are star forming regions. So it is obvious that the stars indeed are forming where there is more molecular material. The crosses here are more evolved uh, uh, stars. And uh, if you want to go even deeper, then uh, you need to go to even rarer isotopologues, in this case, the C18O. So you now you are filtering out this extended emission where the C18O is not very strong because it is probably photodissociated. And then here you start to see the filaments. And these blue dots now are the, what we call the dense cores. So these are the really the beginning, the first units of uh, star formation. And in fact, that we can study them with uh, high density tracers like N2H plus one to zero, etc. So this from here, it starts our journey. Now, let me tell you a little bit before we start the chemistry that indeed in our, uh, say, um, interstellar medium in, a, in our galaxy, more than 270 uh, species have been uh, detected. These are just uh, some of them. They are not uh, all, and this is fine. I mean, you can see actually um, the, um, say, more updated uh, version of this table in the McGuire 2021 uh, live paper. So uh, Brett McGuire is keeping up to date uh, with uh, all the discoveries uh, and once in a while publishes a new uh, paper with uh, all the new uh, detections. And what we see here is that the majority of molecules are actually uh, organic in nature. So here we see uh, that uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, like uh, many of them are actually precursor of, of uh, prebiotic uh, uh, molecules. So for example, in this case, uh, we have uh, the amino acetonitrile that was discovered in 2008 by Arno Belloch and collaborators. And this is just one step away from, uh, from the glycine, which as you know, is the simplest uh, amino acid. Glycine has not yet uh, been detected in this form in this interstellar medium, but has been detected widely in the meteoritic material, primitive material, and in, in the comet that has been recently um, 67P. Uh, we will talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, so there is a lot of interesting chemistry going on, and we will start from the beginning. So this is the outline. We will uh, go uh, relatively briefly in all of these uh, points, starting from the number one step, which is the H2 formation, and moving on toward the complex organic molecules that, uh, as you have probably have already uh, 
say learn, complex organic molecules so for astronomers are those molecules that uh, have at least, uh, say, six atoms. Uh, in, uh, in They have a size of at least uh, six atoms. So let me start with the H2, uh, H2 formation. Now here in this uh, slide title slide, I put uh, a, um, uh, say, an example of dust grain in a diffuse cloud. So, you know, we start with these larger uh, scale clouds before going to these compact and dense regions where stars are forming. In these conditions, uh, there is uh, little uh, uh, ice on top of dust uh, grains. So this is a typical bare dust grain. Where, which could be, say, uh, made out of uh, silicates, so um, amorphous silicates, uh, or, uh, for example, amorphous carbon. And uh, in this, on the surface of these uh, dust grains, as you can see, they're very rough uh, in their uh, surfaces, you, uh, you can have, uh, say, adsorption of uh, hydrogen atoms, for example. And one, once hydrogen atoms say, land on the surface of these dust grains, they can move uh, very fast. And we will see that this is indeed a, a very important process for the formation of H2, because hydrogen atoms can then meet together on the surface and form H2. Uh, so one little parenthesis that I wanted to uh, say tell you is about the fact uh, that, uh, for example, chemistry that happens um, every day, say in our uh, in in our conditions, in terrestrial conditions, so with the very high densities of our atmosphere. So you know, in our atmosphere, we have something like ten to the nineteen uh, molecules per cubic centimeter. So this is a very large number. You have to compare this with, uh, say, ten to the three, ten to the four molecules per cubic centimeter in a molecular cloud. So you can imagine that uh, the, um, say, it, it is very hard to have a chemistry that is similar to, to what happens in, in terrestrial conditions or in atmospheric, say, planetary atmosphere conditions. In molecular clouds, uh, in fact, this, uh, say, the most elementary chemical reaction, so the association, what we call it association of uh, species A with species B, which could be, say, two atoms, then uh, is, uh, so if this happens, it goes into a AB star, where star is means that whatever it is formed has an extra energy that needs to be, um, say, uh, lost. Otherwise, uh, this energy will be so much that the, the two uh, species will just break apart and don't form the AB molecule. So, sorry, I just uh, saw so there, there is some chat. I don't know if uh, there is somebody, uh, so it's, it's, if everything is okay, I will just go on. Otherwise, Sergi, please uh, let me know. If no, I no, need... everything is fine. Ah, okay, thank you. So, okay, so we are here. We, ha we are at this AB star. For AB star to lose energy, um, in our atmosphere, in our Earth, the best uh, uh, solution is to give this energy to a third body. The densities are so high that it's very fast, uh, the collision with another species. So once this happens, as you can see here, you the AB star react or say collide with another species, gives energy to the other species, releases the extra energy and the molecules stabilize. Okay, these, the so-called three body reactions are very, um, are not typically encountered in uh, say molecular clouds. So we can, we can find them in a denser region, like in a protoplanetary disks in the mid plane or in a very close to the protostar where, where you have high uh, densities, but in molecular clouds, this is really very rare, or say so. It will not. So the rate is so low that it will not uh, um, happen. We are talking about rates of the order of say ten to the minus thirty six uh, uh, times the, the the number density cube per cubic centimeter per second. These numbers are really tiny. So 
we need to move on. And uh, this is where now we are going back on the surface of these dust grains. So as I said, this is the first step that we need to take into account. So once you have uh, a hydrogen molecule that is forming on the surface of dust grains, what happens is that you form H2. Now, this H2 should be an H2 star. So it means that you have this formation energy uh, that is kept within the H2 molecule. But now, because the H2 molecule is sitting on the surface of dust grain, this extra energy can be given to the dust. Uh, and uh, basically, it allows the stabilization of the molecule. To, uh, uh, and if there is any extra energy left to the H2 molecule, this will be used by the molecule to actually lift off again and go back into the uh, gas phase. So in fact, uh, uh, I tell you, this reaction is known since a long time. So the first paper that was talking about this dates back to 1963, and this was gold and uh, saltpeter. Many more studies here, I just mentioned a few of those have been, uh, um, say, following up these, making more precise estimates. Uh, uh, etc. But what is important uh, to say, remember, is uh, the form of the rate, uh, formation rate of H2, which is in uh, per cubic centimeter per second, uh, which is given by this uh, uh, expression here. Here, the one half is due to the fact that you are using two hydrogen atoms to form one molecule. And then, you, of course, the rate will be proportional to the number density of hydrogen atoms, the velocity, uh, of a hydrogen uh, um, molecule, so basically it's the, say, turbulent uh, uh, speed, the cross-sectional area of the grain, the number density of dust grains, what we call the sticking probability, which is relatively close to one, except for the most light uh, species like hydrogen, which is closer to, say, to uh, 30%, and then gamma. Gamma is the surface reaction probability, which is actually, uh, in the case of uh, hydrogen formation, is one. So this actually reduces to an even simpler uh, expression for the H2 formation. And the typical numbers that uh, are uh, found are 10 to the minus 17, per cubic centimeter per second, but in regions where there is evidence of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so these very small grains or very large molecules, depending on uh, which point of view you are taking. Uh, so here you have uh, these pHs that are these uh, uh, very thin, um, say, mono layer of carbon atoms with uh, um, in aromatic form, so these uh, cycles uh, with the hydrogen atoms uh, uh, around. And uh, you can have efficient formation of hydrogen on these uh, uh, pHs, and this was, in fact, uh, a, this mechanism has been studied uh, quite a lot uh, in, the, in the recent uh, years. The evidence that H2 has to be formed at a higher rate, about an order of magnitude higher than what we see, say, in, uh, in diffuse clouds, uh, has been uh, uh, clearly shown by these papers by Hubbard et al. in 2004 and Boschmann et al. in 2015. So now that uh, we have our H2 molecules, of course, things get more funny <laughs> for uh, people who are interested in the chemistry because the first step is done. Now the next step is to form molecule. So how do you go on with that? So you have H2 and then you have all these elements in, uh, in atomic form. How do we proceed? So to do, say, order of magnitude estimates and to understand if a certain reaction can proceed or not, one thing you could do is to look into the dissociation energy of the molecule. For example, here we have H2, which has a dissociation energy of 4.48 electron volt, and then there are other uh, species here with their dissociation energy that you can find tabulated, that you can find it very easily, uh, say, online. 
So then the question here could be, can the following reaction proceed in the cold interstellar medium? So this, for example, uh, I have an example here of carbon plus H2. You know that we have carbon atoms, of course, uh, in the uh, interstellar medium. Actually, in diffuse clouds, you mostly have C plus. So you, we could ask if C plus plus H2 proceeds uh, and then form the uh, CH plus or CH, or in the case of oxygen, if you form, o, you can form OH or um, OH plus. So to look in this, to look into this, you have to compare the dissociation energy of H2 with the dissociation energy of the species that are on the right side of these reactions. So let's look more closely to one. For example, and this you can apply then the same thing to the others. So you have carbon plus H, uh, H2 which should form a CH plus H. Is this really going through in, uh, in molecular clouds? Well, first of all, we immediately see that uh, the uh, dissociation energy, or uh, you can also view that as the bond strength of H2, is actually larger than that of uh, CH. So this means that the reaction is not energetically favorable. You see this number here is larger than this. What this is called is endothermicity. So the reaction is endothermic and you can calculate the endothermicity simply doing the difference between these two numbers, which is actually, it amounts to 1.01 electron volt. Now, one electron volt of endothermicity, it's really hard to uh, overcome because actually there is not, in general, on average, there is not so much energy in molecular clouds. And we can uh, know that uh, looking at the temperature of molecular clouds. So, so if you are in a diffuse clouds, you can have temperatures of say of the order of 100 Kelvin. If you are in a denser region, like in a molecular cloud, dark region, then you have temperature of about 10 Kelvin. So with temperatures of 100 Kelvin, Kb, so the amount of energy, equivalent energy, is actually less than 0.01 electron volt. So you can see that you don't have one electron volt to proceed, to make this reaction uh, proceed. Here in this uh, yellow figure, uh, you see actually what, happen what happens in terms of uh, uh, dissociation energy or bond strength that I was talking about. So here is the potential curve and you see here the energy and uh, here is at the minimum when you have the molecule, say, bond together. And then if you increase the separation of the uh, two, uh, say, atoms, uh, you increase here the, uh, the energy until you have a dissociation and uh, the, the two atoms uh, uh, flow apart. So going back to our uh, reaction, so we can see that most of them are actually endothermic. Endothermic by, um, it seems like a small number, but actually, as I said, we have to compare this with the point or one electron volt that is available in the interstellar medium. So all these reactions cannot actually proceed um, easy, uh, easily in, in the interstellar medium. However, there was one that was the O plus plus H2, which is indeed the exothermic, because here the dissociation energy now for the OH plus is larger than H2. So the reaction is energetically favorable. So it can actually proceed and release, uh, say, this 0.62 electron volt of, of energy. Other things that are needed for uh, uh, people who are interested in, for example, running chemical model, we need to understand some concepts. So I will give uh, this concept to you now in uh, simple terms. So one are the rate coefficients. So if you want to know how fast a reaction is uh, going ahead compared to say other reactions, you need to know the rate coefficients and the activation energies. I, I, will, I will explain to you um, also visually what is this activation energy, but just let me start with the rate coefficient, the rate coefficients that are typically, um, and so the symbol of this is a small k, and uh, it's uh, the units are cubic centimeter per second. And so the rate coefficients of a generic reaction that start with, uh, say, um, 
reaction, reactants and ends up in products, C plus D, is given by an average. So these uh, uh, symbols here represent average uh, over the thermal distribution of, uh, say, your gas. Sigma is the total cross-section of the reactants, and B is the relative velocity of the reactants. So now we already said that we already saw that uh, reactions and in general many reactions possess activation energy of the order of 0.11 electron volt, even in case of exothermic uh, reaction. And in this case, in fact, you can see this uh, looking at the Arrhenius formula that uh, was it can be is explained very well in all the details by this uh, uh, relatively old paper, but still really good of Eric Kerbs in 1990, where it shows that the K is uh, in fact exponentially dependent on the activation energy. You see is that you have this activation energy here divided by KBT. KBT is our pocket of energy that is available in, in the cloud. So the Boltzmann constant and the kinetic temperature of, the, of, of your cloud. This is a pre-exponential factor that is a weak function of the temper, temperature. And it depends, of course, on the shape of the uh, reaction potential surface. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a little bit complicated term. But the, what is important is this exponential term to show you how crucial it is uh, to uh, th this activation energy of the um, of the reaction. There is one type, or say, one set of uh, of reactions that are particularly important in cold regions uh, and of molecular clouds, and these are the so-called ion-neutral reactions. Why is that? Because I just mentioned that uh, uh, typically. Um, reactions, even if they are exothermic, need to overcome a barrier. I will show you actually in a, a very soon what I mean by this barrier. But if you have a barrier, then it can be really hard to go through uh, this barrier. However, if your reactants are, uh, say, made out of a ion, which could be an atomic ion or a molecular ion, and a species neut neutral species B, these things are much uh, more, um, uh, how to say, fav fav uh, favorable in, a, in this dark and cold regions of a, uh, interstellar uh, medium. Because uh, as Herbst and Klemperer in 1973, so this was the PhD thesis of uh, Eric Herbst in the 70s, and, and also explain uh, in Anisic uh, and uh, Huntress in 1986, this reaction don't actually possess activation energy. How can it be? This can be just uh, looking at the, this uh, simple picture where you have the ionized particle that actually induces a dipole moment to the neutral particle. So in this case, when you have two charged particles, you can think of this attraction potential that actually the collision of, say, the encounter of these two species is enhanced in energy. So the, velo the relative velocity is enhanced so much that actually the reaction can go on overcoming the, the activation energy. Now, this is the potential. Uh, of the, uh, say, uh, reaction, and this is proportional to alpha. In this case, alpha is the polarizability of the neutral species. Of course, this has to be uh, polarized, uh, able to actually shift the clouds of electrons to have this dipole induced. E is the electronic charge and R is the separation. You can find this formula by simply looking into the, um, say, the property of, uh, say, what is the, to have a sufficiently close encounter. So to, uh, to allow these two species to uh, actually orbit uh, around each other or actually collide. Uh, and or spiraling. And so in this case, uh, uh, and you can actually arrive at this uh, simple equation. The important thing here that I want uh, to arrive at, and this is all explained in fact in Herbst and Clem Klemperer, is that the K, so the rate coefficient in this case, 
has a very simple form. It has a very simple form where you have actually alpha, the polarizability. Mu is the reduced mass uh, in the uh, collision. And you can see basically nothing about activation energy or temperature. So it's independent of temperature. That's why these reactions, uh, this type of reactions are really important in regions where there is little energy to extract uh, from and proceed. And here it is uh, the activation energy that I was talking about. Uh, this is an old picture coming from uh, an old but still valid uh, book from Dooley and Williams in 1984, where actually it shows all these uh, um, in a simplified uh, version, all you need to know about the, the first steps uh, in uh, understanding chemistry in the interstellar medium. So here you have the energy. This is you, you have the reaction path of minimum energy. So you have reactants here, products here. So you see even in exothermic reactions, sometimes you need to overcome this barrier. This is the barrier. And why there is a barrier? Well, because typically, before going to products, you need to modify your reactants. In this particular case, you need, for example, to break the bond, BC bond. So this requires energy. And then you can make another bond. And this, you can do that if this bond is actually stronger than the BC bond. So then it's exothermic. In fact, you see the products go down in energy, you have to go down in energy if you have an exothermic reaction. But even in exothermic reactions, you still have, you may have this activation energy. Remember that in molecular cloud, the budget of energy is less than 0.01 electron volt. So some of these reactions may not proceed. For, uh, for example, neutral neutral reactions are particularly uh, difficult in, um, at least, I mean, this has been, uh, I will show in the next slide that uh, there is some hope in this as well. But uh, for example, here for the oxygen plus H2, which should be, say, the most basic uh, uh, reaction that one could think of after you produce H2, well, this actually cannot proceed in cold clouds because you need to break the H2 bond and then form the OH bond. And there is not enough energy to do that. But however, this reaction, for example, is one of the most important reactions to produce OH in a shocked environment or where the temperature of the gas becomes higher than, say, 200, 250 Kelvin. So, Back to the neutral-neutral reactions. Neutral-neutral reactions, so in this case, you don't have an ion that induces a dipole, and then you have this enhanced uh, energy of the collision that can overcome uh, the barrier. Neutral-neutral reaction have been considered, say, uh, since uh, several years ago, and maybe more challenging because it's very hard to overcome these barriers. However, um, about, say, 10 years ago, um, there had been a work done in uh, Leeds at the University of Leeds. It is a work by Shannon et al. in 2013 that was published in Nature, Nature Chemistry. Now, follow me a little bit now here. I uh, hope you can see my cursor. So here you have the K, so the rate coefficient. And uh, um, this is the temperature. This is 1 over t. Uh, so just focus on the temperature. I think it's easier to follow. So these uh, points here show the measurements that were done before Shannon et al on the system OH plus methanol. This is actually a very important system because it provides then formation of methoxy, which is a, a reactive uh, uh, organic molecule that can then proceed, for example, in the gas phase to form even bigger complex organics, as we will see uh, a little bit later. So this uh, rate was measured uh, at room temperature from say a, a bit higher room temperature, but then down to say about 200 Kelvin. And you can see that this rate was decreasing. And this was in a kind of an exponential uh, form that made sense because if you decrease the temperature, remember the rate goes as e to the minus activation energy divided by kT. So you expect to have this uh, drop in rate. So 
At the time of these older experiments, people were thinking that this reaction cannot proceed in, in the interstellar medium because the temperature in our clouds are actually not even in this scale. They are very far away because they are um, closer, say, to 10 Kelvin in, in, in dark molecular clouds. What Shannon et al. did in 2013, and this work then was followed up by other experiments done in Spain, and you see that they measured this uh, rate uh, at lower temperature, 80 and 66, 67 uh, Kelvin, finding that there is no way that this uh, uh, trend can be extrapolated to low temperature, but you actually have a much uh, higher rates than predicted by the theory. So, this was a, a kind of a breakthrough at that time because, in fact, showed that neutral neutral reaction could go ahead and actually the rates would become even larger at low temperature. So now, you know, I'm sure you're saying, okay, she doesn't make any sense. We need to we need to clear our minds. I don't understand anything anymore. So. What Shannon et al. explained very beautifully in their Nature Chemistry paper was the following. So you take consider these two species, okay? And now uh, you assume that, that they are in a very low temperature environment, so very, very quiet, uh, very slow motions because the temperature is given by the motion of, of the species uh, in, in our molecular cloud, mostly it will be H2, but of course also the other molecules follow, uh, say, similar trends. So you have to imagine these two species that are encountering each other in, in a very, very gentle way, no? Is there some kind of a slow dance? And uh, when they get together, what happened is that there is a, a, what is called a hydrogen bonded complex that is formed. So there is this loosely bound complex, but it's the hydrogen bond that actually uh, allow these two pieces to stay together. And the colder it is, the longer this complex can survive, okay? So then if you have this long-lived complex, so what happened is that there could be and like in this case, there is a tunneling that proceeds during this time that this hydrogen bonded complex is, is existing. So uh, this is what uh, was actually uh, found. And uh, indeed, uh, this work has been, uh, say, later on, uh, also, uh, say, followed up with other reactions, neutral neutral reaction. And there is, uh, of course, not for all of them, but in particular for, for reactions that include this radical OH, there is a way to indeed to abstract. You see here, you abstract the hydrogen from the methanol. In this case, you take one of these hydrogen, you keep it, to make water and leave the methoxy ready to form even more complex molecules. So, so this is a very important process that we need to take into account in the, to understand the chemistry. Now, after the formation of H2, there is another thing that uh, it's super important. So for the formation of H2, we have, I have mentioned the dust grains. This is super important for, uh, say, galaxies like our own that are uh, relatively old. Of course, if you are in an early universe, you don't have dust, so you have to form H2 in some other way. But we are now in the neighborhood, say, in our, in our galaxy. And uh, so we have dust that is very important. The other super important ingredients are cosmic rays. Cosmic, without cosmic rays, we couldn't be here. So cosmic rays, as you uh, probably know, are energetic particles that are accelerated in uh, typically so in uh, during supernovae um, explosion, and they are then propagating through molecular clouds. So they are so energetic that they can just go through molecular clouds without uh, much loss. And uh, so what they do when they enter uh, molecular clouds, 
And for example, the main, uh, say, um, molecule that they encounter is, of course, H2, because that is the most abundant one. And if they do that, uh, they actually, for uh, the majority of the time, uh, say about 97% of the time, they ionize H2 molecules and release electrons. So these electrons have actually extra energy that, in fact, are very important for the heating of this uh, uh, cloud. Now, once you have H2 plus formed, H2 plus is super reactive. And in a molecular cloud where you have uh, many other H2 molecules, what happens is that H2 plus will almost immediately uh, react with another H2 molecule. And this is, look at that, this is an ion molecule reaction. So, and this produces the most important molecular ion in astrochemistry, which is H3 plus. So H3 plus, uh, and then of course there is an extra hydrogen. H3 plus, you can think of it as, so it, this is H3 plus. You can think of it as a, a H2 molecule with the loosely bound proton attached. Now, this loosely boundness, it's very important because this means that this proton can be gi given to, or um, as a present to other elements that are in, in, in these clouds. So let's see what happens. So in uh, uh, molecular clouds, or say even uh, starting from, uh, uh, of course you need to have some H2, there, but once H3 plus is formed, you can have cascade of reactions in the gas phase. Like for example, in this case, assume that H3 plus encounters an oxygen, which is kind of likely because oxygen is one of the most abundant elements. So after hydrogen and helium, we have oxygen. Uh, so uh, H3 plus plus oxygen, what will do? As I told you, there is this loosely bound proton. So the proton will be given to the oxygen and you have an OH plus. Now, reactive species, uh, and this is another, say, secret of astrochemistry, if you, if you want, uh, not really a secret, but it's some kind of uh, um, order of magnitude approximation if you don't know how to proceed to understand uh, the composition of your, of your cloud, chemical composition. If your molecule can react efficiently with the NH2 molecule, you can forget about everything else, every other reactions. Make sure that uh, you, you will be sure that uh, you will be uh, fine if you consider H2 as the uh, main reaction partner, just because the abundance is so much higher say orders of magnitude higher of any other uh, species, okay? So in this case, then OH plus will react with H2. This is uh, in an exothermic reaction. So we'll abstract the hydrogen from H2O plus, and then this procedure will go on until you arrive here at H3O plus, and H3O plus cannot get another hydrogen, just is not, uh, um, there is no valence electron and uh, it cannot proceed. So the only uh, thing that H3O plus can do is to recombine dissociatively, you can see here, dissociatively with electrons that are available in the cloud to produce either water or OH or oxygen. And this is depending, so the fraction of water, OH and oxygen depends of course on the, what we call the branching ratio of these uh, uh, reactions with electrons. And for example, you can even for molecular oxygen, if you uh, have uh, OH reacting with uh, ox uh, atomic oxygen. So the H3 plus basically allow the formation of OH and water and O2 in the gas phase starting from this simple, uh, simple reaction and cascade of reactions. Similarly, very similar is also the chemistry related to carbon. And this is particularly important because organic molecules of contain carbon. So in fact, we have here a very similar cascade as we have seen for the oxygen. So you have the carbon atoms here and the H3 plus, you see here proton transfer, the transfer of the proton from the H3 plus to the carbon, which gives you the CH plus. And then you have this series of abstraction reactions. So H2 provides an extra hydrogen and these 
uh, reaction cascade, the say proceeds until again the reaction with another H2 becomes less favorable. Uh, and in this case, for example, the CH3 plus when it arrives here, it can actually uh, also can also actually um, react with H2, but the rate is really low in this case. So it can more favorably, uh, depending also on the ionization fraction present in your cloud, can react and form CH2 or CH. So this is the down of hydrocarbon chemistry. So these, again, the yellow uh, arrows here mean dissociative recombination of uh, these particular ions with, uh, with the electrons. So let me then uh, move to the formation of, uh, say, CO, because CO is the, after H2, is the most abundant molecule. And actually, it's much more useful than H2 uh, because the CO is easily excited. Here is uh, just a uh, little, say, simple example that shows the H2 that are uh, kicked uh, by some H2. Uh, so this is CO kicked by H2 molecules. And when they are kicked, so there is some transfer of energy. They, are, uh, they, they get, uh, uh, say, excited to the first uh, layer uh, of uh, so the first energetic level for the rotational ladder. Um, and uh, but then they because the density, as I said, are so low in molecular cloud, the CO will just go back in the ground state, emitting this beautiful line at 2.6 millimeter that we have seen in the map of the entire galaxy. So it is very important to understand because it is again a very important molecule because we see we observe it very uh, easily and uh, it provides a lot of information on, uh, say, the, uh, the, the chemistry, uh, as well as, uh, say, the temperature, and, uh, uh, say, it's, uh, of course, a major component of, uh, of the gas. So how does it form? So we, if you remember in the previous slides, I have mentioned H3O plus and CH3 plus as ending points to this cascade of reactions starting from H3+. So here, if you, for example, if you have H3O+, and then um, you add a carbon, you can form HCO+, plus H2. Same if you have a CH3+, reacting with an oxygen, you can also form HCO+, plus H2. And then from here, it's a very easy, it's a, easy step to go from HCO plus to CO because, in fact, it can dissociatively recombine with electrons and form CO. And this is the most important source of CO in, say, mole in, fact, in molecular uh, clouds. Once a CO is, uh, is formed, it's really difficult to remove. That's, of course, the reason why there is a lot of CO everywhere in, in our galaxy and also in external galaxies. So it reacts, it can react with H3 plus. Fine, you see here H3 plus can, can give the proton to the CO form HCO plus, plus H2. However, this is not a, a real destruction mechanism because you see, you go back to C here, to this reaction, and you see that the HCO plus can go back to CO. So it's, it's some kind of loop that you, uh, you, you do. And in fact, this loop is very convenient because you can have a, a rough uh, estimate. If you can observe C on HCO plus in your cloud, you can have a rough estimate of the electron fraction, which is, of course, a super important for magnetized clouds as the ones that we are observing. So the main mechanisms that remove CO from the gas phase are actually mainly two except as we will see also the freezing now onto the surface of dust grains, but this happens in a very dense and cold environment. So the main mechanism for, for removing CO are reaction with helium plus. I say helium plus, uh, where is helium, why is helium plus there? Well, helium plus is there because the cosmic rays are ionizing helium. And in fact, they, uh, you can have a significant uh, amount of helium plus that could become important um, to actually remove. And this is a, 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 a real remove, or a, a, say destruction of CO, because you see 
the helium plus plus here makes the C plus and oxygen. So it's destroying the triple bond uh, of the CO. The same thing, of course, is true for, for the photons. So, so if you are in the outer part of the cloud where you have enough UV photons, you can actually photo dissociate the molecule. In more diffuse clouds, so if you start, uh, for example, in regions where the carbon is mostly in C+, CO can form through also these uh, various uh, reactions, as I showed here. So you can have C+, uh, reacting with OH, that forms CO+. Then CO+, uh, can actually abstract the hydrogen from uh, the H2 to form HCO+. Or, for example, if you have water, you can also form uh, HCO plus um, from C plus plus H2O. And then once you have HCO plus, you go back to this C uh, reaction. And from here, I just wanted to give you a rough, uh, say, understanding of on the time scale for formation of CO. And you see, you will see that actually the time scale is also very fast. So now, here to simplify things, we are just assuming that we are in a dark region where most of the hydrogen is in H2, and uh, um, all atoms are in neutral form. So there is there are no uh, ionized there is no ionizing radiation um, in the in the cloud. So if we make this uh, simplistic assumption, then the time scale on which all carbon, or say almost all carbon, becomes contained in CO. Remember that the number density, of, so the oxygen, uh, ele uh, so elementally speaking, so the elemental abundance of oxygen is larger than the elemental abundance of carbon. So in, in our galaxy, at least. So this is at least equal to the time scale for one hydrogen molecule to be ionized for every carbon. Why is that? Remember that we need to have H3 plus to, uh, as a first step that then gives uh, a, um, say, a proton to the carbon atom. So that, that is the limiting step. So equal to the time scale for one H2 to be ionized, because then you can have H3 plus almost immediately. You see, we don't even think here, we don't even mention H3 plus, because once you have H2 plus, it goes immediately to H3 plus in a dark uh, cloud. And this uh, to be ionized for every carbon uh, atom. So this time scale then will be equal to the number density of carbon atoms. This is the elemental abundance of carbon divided by this rate of formation of uh, CO, which is given by the cosmic ionization rate, times the number density of the H2 uh, uh, molecules. So, so in, a, in a sense, you can also now take consider the fact that NH2 is equal to two times the NH, so you can have a better looking equation here. And also you have NC over NH, so the elemental abundance of carbon about 10 to the minus 4, cosmic rayonization rate of about a few times 10 to the minus 17 per second. So the above expression gives a value of about 2 times 10 to the 5 years. So although this may seem long, actually you have to compare this with the lifetime of molecular clouds, which is of the order of, say, at least a million years or more. So the time scale for the formation of CO in a molecular cloud is really short. So again, these are the processes going from C, H3+, plus, proton, um, say the, the proton goes to the carbon, and then abstraction reaction, reaction with oxygen, formation of CO+, plus, recombination with electrons, and formation of CO. And now, I before I stop for a few minutes, um, um, I wanted to give you this uh, next information, and this is about nitrogen chemistry. So I mentioned that so far that carbon and oxygen atoms both re can react with H3+, and do a rich, uh, say, chemistry in the gas phase, produce on one side the water, in the other hydrocarbons. Nitrogen is not the same as carbon or oxygen in a sense that it does not like to react. So it does not react, in fact, with H3+, because this reaction uh, cannot proceed. It's not energetically favorable. And uh, what happened is that if you wanted to make 
molecular nitrogen and from atomic nitrogen, you have to go through neutral neutral reactions. And here, uh, you know, remember that the neutral neutral reaction, okay, they can proceed, but they are a bit slower, can be a bit slower than the um, uh, ion molecule reaction. So, so they will go ahead. This is a little schema, chemical schema that you can find in Hilleblant et al. 2010 paper and also Flower et al. 2006. That you you show that there is this uh, uh, cascade of reactions. So N reacting, for example, with CH producing CN, and then you need another neutral neutral reaction to form N2, and you need N2 to form very important molecules that are actually the ones that we use for observations, which is ammonia on one side or N2H plus in the other side. Now, if we look, if we consider our chemical models, we can see that for assuming similar physical conditions as the one that we have considered for the CO formation, we can see that the N2 time scale is about five, between five and 10 times longer to form compared to CO. In UV shielded clouds, okay, same, same condition as before. So it takes longer. And this was already known uh, actually even before the papers that I mentioned. This is a beautiful paper by Amiel Stanberg and Dalgarno back in 1995, where they actually studied the chemical processes in uh, the Orion bar, which is a very well known and very well studied uh, photo dissociation region. And you can see here that uh, here you have extinction. So as a function of abundance of a certain species. And you can see that uh, here uh, you have to consider these um, plots as entering the cloud. So here the extinction is zero. So here you have all the radiation from the trapezium cluster here. And then you go to higher and higher extinction. So you are entering the molecular cloud. So you see that at the very beginning, so with extinction even less than one magnitude, you start to form very rapidly CO because CO is very easy to form, as I showed you before. While for N2, it takes longer to arrive at, uh, say, abundances that becomes now comparable with the atomic nitrogen. And you see here in 2H plus, whoa, it takes really long. Uh, so you have to go deep, deep to, to have N2H plus. Okay, now it's uh, one hour, uh, um, and I would like maybe a couple of minutes, two, three minutes of, uh, say, short break, and then we will come back, uh, say, yeah, I think two, three minutes is enough. I just take a little water and then uh, come back to you. So then we can proceed with the ice formation and freeze out, and we are getting close to the complex organic uh, molecule. So I will uh, then uh, uh, just... Uh, let's see where I am. So stop my video for two minutes and then come back soon. I hope it's okay, Sergi. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Let's proceed in this way. Yes, thank you, thank you. I'll see you in a few minutes.
I am back. So, Sergey, if the others are on, I can continue. Yes, please. Go okay. Ahead. Good. So, thanks for allowing me <laughs> this little break. So, okay. So, now we start with the ice formation. So, I spent a little bit more time at the very basic because I want to... to keep following me in the next steps. So, so you have already seen this figure, which is the figure of the dust grain, a bare grain and the diffuse cloud with the H2 forming on top. This is actually something else. This is another grain, it's an artistic view, again, that shows a little kind of uh, almost a snowball. And we will see that this is the type of, uh, um, uh, we imagine, in our, we considering our uh, chemical uh, models uh, that indeed, uh, deep inside the, the clouds where stars, just before stars are forming, they will, uh, the dust grains will become covered by thick icy mantles. So let's see how this works. So first of all, uh, to understand the surface chemistry, so there is still a lot of, uh, um, say, to understand on the surface chemistry, but uh, the very basic uh, it can be explained with this a simple figure. So assume this is the surface of your dust grains, and you have here site of adsorption. This is where species like hydrogen can, uh, say, adsorb. And then uh, you can have different type of uh, chemi chemistry uh, or reactions. So for the first, you, of course, you have to accrete the, the atom or the molecule. Then this atom uh, or molecule should uh, be able to follow, uh, say, go around the surface. And we will see that this is mostly important for light species like hydrogen and deuterium. And uh, they can actually thermal hop on the uh, barriers that are uh, separating these uh, sites of absorption. So light uh, species can also quantum tunnel uh, in, uh, to, to diffuse. And if they encounter another reactive species, they can then react, like in the case of H plus H, forming H2, and then uh, release uh, the energy of formation, and uh, they can also desorb after the formation, or can also desorb before for, uh, encountering a partner, especially if the dust temperature is relatively large. The, this depends, of course, on the binding energy of the species. Another, so this uh, type of uh, chemistry on the surface is called uh, the Langmuir uh, heinzel uh, uh, reaction scheme, but there is also the so-called Illyridium. These, of course, are names of people, important people who have actually studied these uh, reactions and physics of reactions on, uh, on, uh, on the surface. The Illyridium mechanism is actually when you have a species coming from uh, the gas phase and impinging directly, directly onto a adsorption site that is already occupied, so it can actually react immediately. Now here I put some, I mean, the literature is really long, so I put some uh, papers that you can have a look uh, from, say, the beginning, from Thielens and Hagen uh, paper, a famous paper in the 80s, uh, to much uh, more, uh, say, uh, comprehensive uh, um, uh, say, reaction schemes, for example, with Rob Garrod and collaborators. Okay, so in uh, typically molecular, in say, chemis, chemical codes, we assume very simplistically that dust grains are about 0.1 micrometer in size, and they have a total of about a million sites of absorption, adsorption on their surfaces. So what happened on their surfaces? <coughs> So first of all, you can, if uh, you have a hydrogen or also a deuterium, these species are very mobile, very fast, and they can actually, uh, say, go around and find the partner, like in the case of hydrogen. Or, for example, if you have oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, or CO, you can actually uh, uh, hydrogenate these species and form very fast water. So from oxygen, you go, you just go to OH and then water, that's it, because water is uh, uh, 
you cannot add another hydrogen uh, to water then from for carbon you go all the way to methane nitrogen all the way to uh, ammonia and co all the way to methanol so these are the saturated forms of all these uh, species and uh, this is very fast because in fact uh, you can i put here some numbers so to accrete, so everything is limited by the accretion of these species on the surface. So, for example, here for the accretion, because the densities are so low, so the, you can consider like something like every 10 days uh, or so, or a few days, uh, considering here there is the temperature, and one hydrogen atom can actually go onto the surface of that grain. So the process is really slow in this uh, dark. Uh, uh, region or even uh, say in, in more diffuse clouds, but we have to be careful in diffuse clouds because you have also a lot of photons that can photodesorb, photodissociate. Once the species touches the ground of the, of the dust grain, then if can quantum tunnel like for hydrogen, then the tunneling rate is so fast. You see here that this is the time scale for tunneling, sweeping around the whole dust grain. It's only a fraction of a second. So this is, in fact, one of the problems that we have in chemistry. We are dealing with the very different time scales for the formation of these species. On the one side, very, very rapid on the surface, but then we have this accretion, the two-body collisions, and things that proceed much slower. So things can actually slow down. All this can slow down very much models. If you, for example, if you wanted to model the dynamics of a cloud, including the chemistry, this process, of course, can slow down a lot your uh, your chemistry and the, the dynamical evolution. So one thing that we need to consider is, uh, and in fact, it's very uh, important for this uh, specific topic of the, of the freeze-out, is uh, uh, at the time scales. Because when we talk about the chemistry, it's uh, in the in interstellar medium, you always want to compare, say, the time scale for a certain reaction, or in this case, for the freeze-out, with the dynamical time scale. So here, in this figure, we have the time scale in years, as a function of number density of hydrogen nuclei, so hydrogen and H2 molecules. And you can see here that the freeze out, this is the line for the freeze out. The freeze out, the time scale is, is one over the rate of freeze out, and this is the rate. And these, uh, num these um, say, quantities are the sticking coefficient. Uh, sorry, I used a different symbol from the previous uh, formula, but this is the sticking coefficient, the number density of dust grains, uh, the sigma pi ad squared. This is the cross section of the of the particle, and this is the thermal uh, velocity. So the the, uh, the velocity of uh, of your uh, particle. So if you put in uh, typical values, uh, for example, of the sticking coefficient, say one, and the typical number density, uh, and then of course this is a function of an H, uh, and the typical size of dust grains, uh, you see that the order of magnitude estimate is that the time scale for freeze out of a certain species is 10 to the 9 years divided by the number density of, the, of your cloud. So if you are in a cloud of 10 to the 4, you see that now here you have about, say, 10 to the 5 years to uh, freeze out. But 10 to the 5 is not so uh, long because, as I mentioned before, the lifetime of these molecular clouds can be even 1 million year or even longer. So uh, this is a problem. And the other problem is that within the same time frame, if a cloud is gravitationally bound, so it will actually it can actually contract and uh, um, collapse to form, say, a star. The free fall time scale is actually longer than the freeze out. And in taking into account the magnetic fields, so then the ambipolar diffusion, which is actually a slower process because ions and neutral can say collide, the ions are along the magnetic field lines, you can have a slower contraction motion. All the time scales are actually written down here. 
uh, for the amipolar diffusion that depends on the electron fraction and the free fold time that depends on the density inverts the square root of the density. So you can see that if you look at this figure, you expect that basically all the molecules should freeze out way before the, uh, the cloud is collapsing. But actually, we don't see that. We don't see that we have all the molecules disappear. So at some point, actually, yes, I will show you. But uh, in general, in molecular clouds, we still have uh, you know, a lot of CO and other molecules that are present. So of course, uh, here, we are not taking into account the absorption processing that uh, uh, are actually important, including, for example, non-thermal desorption. Of course, the thermal desorption does not proceed in these conditions of 10 Kelvin because, uh, say, molecules don't have the energy to go back. But non-thermal desorption, like due, for example, to the impinging of cosmic rays and other um, processes, like even the formation of a molecule on the surfaces, and I will talk about it that. So, we know that there are uh, uh, ices on top of these dust grains, and uh, this was done uh, uh, already, um, uh, say, well, also with uh, ground-based uh, 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 telescopes. But for example, with the Spitzer telescope, uh, we had beautiful spectra uh, along the line of sight of background stars from so stars that are behind the cloud. Then you look at the spectrum of the star, and if this, if the uh, light, say, if the, if the light of the star uh, goes through a cloud before coming to us, you will then start to see absorption features that are in correspondence of certain wavelengths that can be recognized as a specific solid molecule, like, for example, in this beautiful spectrum here. So we see, of course, the silicates at the 10 micron because you have a lot of amorphous silicates uh, in, the, in the dust, but you also see water ice, methanol ice, carbon dioxide ice. And now with JWST, you have probably seen much uh, more complex uh, structures. Of course, the sensitivity of JWST is so high that allows you to even see uh, com more complex organics. And now here, I just put an example. This is the, from the paper in Nature Astronomy from uh, Melissa McClure, a, a collaborator of the Ice Age collaboration that shows uh, these very, very strong absorption features uh, uh, along the line of sight of a ground star in uh, a very dark region where the extinction in one case is a 60 magnitude and in the other is 95 magnitude. So you see a lot of, um, say, well-known, the usual suspects, so uh, CO, water, CO2, methanol, and, and ammonium, uh, etc. But if we look closely to the wavelength range between seven and eight uh, micrometer, actually we start to see interesting fissures that are in correspondence of uh, more complex organics. Like for example, here we have the acetaldehyde, this blue line, uh, so, so these uh, spectra here are from the lab. Uh, from the Leiden uh, lab. Uh, so here we have acetaldehyde, then we have uh, CH3CHO uh, also. Acet um, um, so this is uh, ethyl alcohol and then acetone. <clears throat> and uh, you can see that uh, in the observed spectra, there are features that correspond to the uh, wavelength of, of these uh, complex organics. Beautiful uh, data are also presented in, uh, more in the um, very recently, uh, say, posted on our archive in December by Rocha, uh, Evina, Van de Souk, et al. in 2023. Uh, and this is towered, uh, say, uh, protostellar uh, objects. So there is also an indi another uh, indirect uh, way to know that uh, these molecules disappear from the gas phase and actually deplete on top of the surface. Uh, this is a much older <laughs> work uh, that I remember I um, 
I really enjoyed doing um, uh, a long time ago. So this is what we call the catastrophic CO-off result, because at some point, if you look at one of these uh, dense cores, we call it pristellar cores, the cores that are actually have evidence of contraction, and they are going to form a star soon, but they have not yet a protostar inside. You can see in the millimeter wavelength, a very well-defined peak. This is where the majority of the gas is. Uh, so the density is the highest. But if we look at the CO, in particular C17O, to avoid problems with optical depth, this is a very rare isotopologue, more than 2,000 times less abundant than the, the 12C16O isotopologue. And here you see in correspondence of the dust peak, we have a CO hole. And the only way, or say the simplest way to explain this disappearance of CO is actually to have a CO coated onto the, uh, onto the dust the grain. More recently, so I actually you, we can easily say that more than 90% of the CO molecules are frozen onto the dust grains within the central uh, five to 6,000 astronomical units uh, in, the, say in the center. More recently, we have done uh, work with ALMA in the same object and showing, uh, this time uh, looking at the deuterated ammonia. I'm not going to talk about the deuteration uh, today, I don't have the time, but uh, just uh, to uh, say that deuterated molecule typically tend to like the uh, very cold and dense region Again, for from a point of view of the chemistry, it's uh, say easily explained because we have reactions that are exothermic and tend to uh, say increase the uh, production of deuterated molecule. So with this uh, deuterated molecule observations that we did with ALMA at 110 gigahertz, so this is the band three observations. Uh, you see, the, we made a mosaic to make sure that we didn't lose any flux. And what we did, we look at the spectra along this radius and also this radius here. And here I show some of the spectra and the overlap you see in red is our modeling. So the model of our chemical model considering the physical structure of F1544. So if we do that, our so to reproduce the observations, we need uh, to let the deuterated am ammonia uh, freeze out almost completely toward this in within the central 2000 astronomical unit of our model core. And if we look at all the other species in our model, we see that inside 2000 AU, we have an almost complete freeze out. Uh, so we have a total depletion uh, factor that goes up to 10 to the 4. So total depletion factor, this is the sum of gas plus dust divided by gas. So if you have a total depletion factor of 10 to the 4, it means that the 1, so 0.1%, 0.1% of species heavier than helium are left in the gas phase. So you have a gas phase that is mostly rich and rich with hydrogen, deuterium, helium, but everything else, so the volatiles are locked in these tiny uh, dust grains. So uh, just uh, to give you a visualization of this, so you think about your dark core, this is P68, very famous uh, 2001 uh, paper from Joao Alves. So think that in the center, you have these dust grains that are, have uh, thick layers of ice. We, with our models, of course, so we don't know exactly how this is structured, but with our model, we have more than a hundred monolayers of ice. And you think that uh, this uh, is, uh, so these conditions are just before the formation of this protostar and protoplanetary disk. So this means that we have a storage uh, reservoir here of ice and volatile water organics in this uh, that will actually feed later on the protoplanetary disk where uh, planets are going uh, to form. And of course, with JWST, uh, now the first paper are coming out looking also at the ices in, in disk, and but also we need more data for these cold regions, the central region of pristellar core, to actually test our modeling. So 
Um, the cosmic rays, briefly, I wanted to say that indeed they are uh, very important for the chemistry. We already saw that they are the ones that uh, produce, allow the production of H3+, the most important molecular ion in astrochemistry, but also they can have interesting uh, uh, effects if one takes into, into account these icy grains. So where you have the um, refractory core of, the, of your dust um, surrounded by these icy uh, mantles. One thing that, uh, in fact, they are important about is that they provide a way to um, say, allow some remnants, although very small amount, but some remnants of molecules in the gas phase, okay? So this is, for example, what we found back in 2012 when we use Herschel within the uh, water in star forming region with Herschel, larger project that was led by Evina van de Souk. So here what we did, we uh, stared for 13 hours at L1544, so this uh, pre-stellar core in Taurus, and we detected for the first time water in emission in a cold region. And the more than that, this line is, has the inverse P-sigma profile, as you can see here, emission and absorption, absorption at, uh, say, higher velocity, that shows info. So the way, the only way to uh, reproduce this uh, wing, the blue wing of the water, was to allow some of the water at very low level, you know, 10 to the minus nine uh, in abundance compared to H2, instead of the 10 to the minus four of water that you have in ice uh, to reproduce what we, we observed. So in fact, the main result of this study were first of all, this subsonic infall. So we have this contraction of the central region at a very relatively slow rate within the central 1000 AU, we measure the mass of water vapor and deduce the total mass of water ice. Look at this, 2.6 Jupiter masses of water already available uh, just even before forming the protostar. And then the cosmic rays again are important because they allow water desorption. But cosmic rays don't just do that. Why they allow uh, desorption? Well, there are several processes. One is just, uh, say, heating uh, the whole grain, for example, and allow uh, molecules to desorb, but this doesn't really work for water. Another is, in fact, the, uh, the, the fact that the, the cosmic rays can both ionize, uh, I mentioned 97%, if you remember, um, uh, roughly 97% of the H2 molecules are ionized and then you, you form H3+. Plus. But you can also, so co cosmic rays can also excite H2 molecules and then they fluoresce back. And during this fluorescence, they produce a very tenuous UV field and the UV photons produced by the cosmic rays can actually uh, allow some of the molecules to photodesorb. Uh, from the from the surface. Another thing that they do, and this is shown in these uh, beautiful pictures that was uh, done uh, by Chris uh, Schingledecker, and uh, he, he shows uh, here is grain. So we are on the top of the dust grain. So this is the silicate or say anyway, refractory part of the dust grain. This is the icy mantle on top. And you see here, if you have the cosmic rays, cosmic rays can go through the, the dust, and while they go through, they form a hot cylinder uh, on one side, and in the other, they are actually producing secondary electrons that go, uh, say, perpendicular to the direction of propagation, which can start interesting chemistry. For example, they can break bonds, you can get rid of hydrogen from the water, produce the reactive OH, and form more complex species. And these processes have been studied. Um, they are continuing to be studied. These are very, very complex, uh, and uh, uh, there is still a lot of work to be done. And uh, for example, yeah, there, there have been papers uh, published in 2015, and also more recently last year by Alexei Iblev at the Max Planck, uh, uh, the working on the theory and also experiments of uh, this uh, interaction between, uh, say, energetic particles and ice 
in this case, you, you have the column, the, this hot column produced by cosmic rays. And Chris Schingledecker, during his PhD with Eric Kerbst, and also when he came to Max Planck with the Humboldt Fellowship, he did uh, a lot of work on, uh, on this. Uh, for example, here is uh, his PhD work when he was uh, looking into trying to reproduce experiments that shows that you have a primary ion uh, say with the energy, say 100 kilo electron volt uh, protons that are propagating into O2 ice. And here you see the secondary electrons and he reproduced the experiments based on his, uh, uh, say, um, uh, code that includes ionizing radiation. And he also showed that with cosmic rays, you can even enhance the the Comes so these complex organic molecules because you are allowing these uh, uh, react so the, the um, radicals to be produced more copiously inside the ice and then you can form a more complex organics. An interesting point that uh, maybe some of you could be interested in is the sulfur chemistry. So. Uh, Chris Schingledecker showed that uh, taking into account uh, the ice uh, formation, so you have water ice, but for example, for sulfur, you make H2S, which is the equivalent in a sense of uh, H2O. Uh, you make a lot of it, but in presence of cosmic rays, uh, you, um, there is the breaking of the bonds of this H2S molecule in the surface and the tendency for the sulfur to produce allotropes. So these uh, chains were well, actually uh, say S2, S3, S4, and other allotropes uh, culminating into the most stable form of sulfur, which is the S8, this beautiful crown that you can actually see as a yellow form, in yellow form in the rocks, uh, in a, if you go nearby a volcano or sulfur-rich uh, uh, part of the earth. And uh, you can see this yellow, um, say, areas on the on the uh, on the stone and that is s8 so he was able to actually uh, put significant amount of uh, sulfur in this s8 which is actually not observable so this could solve the problem of the sulfur and what is the problem of the sulfur the sulfur we know that it's in the gas phase in diffuse clouds but when we go to dark clouds there is a missing sulfur. We don't know where the sulfur is gone. We cannot see it. Even if we try to measure a lot of sulfur beating molecules, there is still a lot of missing sulfur that we, were, we don't know where to put it. And this could be a way to actually put it in this refractory material that is not observable uh, unless, for example, you are absorbing part of these uh, chains, uh, like, for example, S2, S3, and, and S4, had been detected in the comet uh, uh, 67P um, in the coma. So it could well be that, indeed, uh, we have these chains formed thanks to the cosmic rays. Right, so now, uh, in the last, uh, say, um, minutes, I would like to, before we stop for the, for the questions, I'd like to say a little bit more about complex organic molecules, uh, because, of course, we want to get closer to the, um, say, to the prebiotic molecules. So, so complex organic molecules, as I said, they have more than six atoms. And uh, they have been detected in uh, very active star-forming regions. So this is a spectrum uh, coming from the beautiful paper by Crockett et al. in 2015, showing the spectrum coming from uh, the Orion uh, region uh, taken with uh, Herschel. But we don't need to go uh, in uh, star-forming regions be, uh, or say in the very active star-forming region because uh, we know that complex organics are also present already in this uh, very cold and very uh, low temperature environment. And this is an example. There are many papers, many people are actively working on this uh, to look at how far we can go in the complexity of the chemistry. Um, for these uh, for these uh, clouds, and here is uh, another one of these very cold regions with the very well defined center uh, that is Inofucus. So this is the HMM1 Inofucus, and this is the deteriorated ammonia map done with Alma. But if we tune to the frequency of methanol, which is the simplest com complex organic molecule, 
because in fact has uh, say um, six atoms and also is uh, precursors of much more complex organics. So you see that the methanol tend to be in a ring around this cloud. And this is understood with the fact that the complex organic molecules form at the when the CO start to catastrophically freeze out onto the surface of dust grains. And this is work that uh, I'm not going into the detail. This is uh, in 2017, Anton Vazunin uh, made uh, this uh, nice uh, work uh, focusing on one of the objects where we had the majority of the data and finding that indeed you have uh, uh, you can have this increase in abundance of the methanol not in the center but, but in the outer part say of the core exactly where CO started to catastrophically freeze out and why is that the reason for this is due to the fact that you have ices in these regions that are rich in CO and once you have CO rich surfaces and this is work based on laboratory work by Minisal et al you see that here is a reactive desorption efficiency so this is the efficiency of desorption upon the reaction for example, in the case of uh, formaldehyde and methanol, just focus on methanol because this is the end point of the hydrogenation of CO. So you can see that if you have mostly water rich surface, the reactive desorption is very low. Basically the CO forms and uh, is able to give back most of the energy to the water molecules basically. But in the case of a CO rich surface, there is a bouncing uh, of the molecule in the, in say, a, a certain probability of bouncing back in the gas phase. And this is, uh, you can see here, is still low, about 10 to the minus two, but it's enough to allow us to have enough methanol in the gas phase to reproduce what we observe. And this is very important because again, it's, uh, it can also explain how you actually form more complex organics in the gas phase, uh, starting from the methanol, and also with a series of neutral-neutral reaction, going back to what I saw here, there is a lot of work also from, uh, say, uh, Nadia Balucani and uh, Cecilia Ceccarelli, uh, Scout Harris, and other people who have been looking into uh, Bazar et al, uh, that have been looking at these neutral-neutral uh, reactions that can actually make a complex organic in the gas phase. By the way, this is the reaction, uh, reactive desorption efficiency as a function of effective mass of surface. So it's not really the mass of the molecule, but it's the mass of what we call a surface structural element, you know, which is made of a group of molecules uh, on the surface. It's not just that you form a methanol and then the methanol reacts with one water molecule or one CO molecule. It reacts with, the, uh, say, a little packet of, of molecules in a solid form. So just to give you an example, this is uh, a beautiful paper by, uh, say, Ser uh, Sergio Iopolo that uh, was published in 2021 in Nature Astronomy, showing the pathways toward glycine, because glycine was found, in fact, in the comet 67P. And so it was interesting to see if we could actually arrive at glycine without any processing of the ice, without UV, because this must happen in these dark regions where UV photons are not present. So this is in fact shows that starting with some precursors of glycine and without any UV, you can actually go all the way from say simple species up to glycine. And here I also mention the paper by my chair here uh, that uh, was in fact in 2022 also in Nature Astronomy paper that showed also a very nice pathway to uh, say peptides in, in space starting from carbon atom adsorption onto uh, surfaces. So uh, let me give you then uh, just uh, a few more uh, things, um, information. Because once you have the protostar formed, some of these ice will be evaporating. Because if you are close enough to the protostar, 
sorry, you can actually get the heater by the protostar, or there may be, say, shocks that uh, vaporize the ice, so you can have this release of uh, species back in the gas phase. Uh, again, here there is a lot of literature, you know, on, uh, for example, uh, starting from Hector Arce et al. in 2008, uh, finding complex organics along outflows. So this is a beautiful map uh, showing the interaction of an outflow with the molecular cloud, so the release of uh, species also from Jorgensen et al. But also in hot core and hot corinos, so you can see a lot of uh, complex organics. So these are the regions nearby proto starts massive for hot cores and hot corinos are for the low mass sources. And what we believe, uh, what we are looking at here are these central region where you have, uh, say, the protoplanetary disk forming, and then in these early phases becomes pretty hot, and you can have the release and uh, of, of molecules back in, in the gas phase. It's interesting to show that uh, actually, if you compare the organics with uh, uh, that are found in these uh, young star forming regions with those that are found in the comets uh, 67 pip that was visited by the Rosetta uh, mission uh, you can find a pretty good correlation so this is work done by Maria Drozdoskaya and collaborators. And uh, it's interesting that this correlation is basically telling us that uh, the volatile composition, this is, I just quote uh, some words from their paper, um, volatile composition of cometesimal and planetesimal is partially inherited from the pre and protostellar phases of evolution. So there is, there is uh, some uh, inheritance of, uh, of these early phases of, uh, <clears throat> of chemistry. Then, you know, we ca I can cite uh, beautiful uh, data like uh, the discovery uh, in a solar type protostar of uh, the glycolaldehyde, which is the simple sugar. And then, of course, this can go all the way to form ribose, uh, that is the backbone of RNA. Recently, Rivilla et al. found ethanolamine, which is, uh, the uh, say, forms this uh, hydrophilic head of uh, the simplest, uh, most abundant uh, phospholipid uh, in membranes, like is it is shown here. So you have all the ingredients uh, in, uh, in, uh, in gas phase. And uh, Jimenez Serre, Tascon Jimenez Serre, and collaborators are actively working into understanding the missing pieces to arrive at RNA formation, because RNA is indeed the what is uh, needed, as far as we know, to start life on planets. So to conclude, I wanted to mention that if we look into our primitive material, in particular carbonaceous chondrites, they are just treasure boxes, okay? Because they include, they contain everything we need to form a living being. Of course, going from uh, the ingredients to a living being, it takes uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, chemistry and uh, biochemistry. And uh, this is of course going beyond uh, what, uh, uh, what I know, but I think it's also in general, it's still uh, people are still struggling to understand how you go from these building blocks to RNA. This is the big question mark. Uh, the more experimentally, but you see that in some of this material, more than 200 amino acids have been found, 20 are used uh, by all living beings on Earth. So even much more, so in order of magnitude more than what we need, uh, say, for living beings on Earth. There are fatty acids, there are bases, all bases of RNA and DNA, uh, as you can find in this paper by Ovital 2022. And ribose has been detected. So, and you can make these molecules from the building blocks that we have seen before. So you can think of these planet, so these small rocks containing probably simple ices and then going through processing. And uh, within, uh, say, the young, uh, during the early phases of our sun, and then arriving at this uh, complexity. Then, of course, uh, theoretically, you can actually make uh, RNA, 
There had been work by Peirce et al., including also Thomas Henning and Dima Semenov uh, at uh, MPIA, where actually they show that if you have, if you take into account uh, this uh, material depositing onto the early Earth with uh, a continuous uh, cycle of day and night, wet and dry, you can actually break bones, form new bones, produce more complex species until you arrive at the RNA formation in a very short time. They say within 200 million years of the moon forming impact, that was 4.2 billion years ago. So it's really fast. So if we can only prove it experimentally, we are almost done. Of course, then you have to make life a living being, but you know, once you form RNA, is a really a big uh, uh, milestone. And uh, this is my final slide, just to connect to the fact we shouldn't forget that these uh, planetesima, these rocks that are filled with um, volatile organics, prebiotic molecules, are the building blocks of planets. And if you read this beautiful uh, review from PP7 by Kreit and et al, uh, 2022, you can find it in the archive, they show how uh, you can actually consider in the say um, where the planet is formed, if it is like a water world or a, or an Earth-like planet or a Venus-like planet. You can and considering all the exchanging between the exchanges between the atmosphere and the interior, you can actually uh, also produce. Uh, um, say, organics uh, that uh, uh, can be important, uh, say, for starting uh, life on, uh, on them. So with this, I end, and I'm opening up for uh, questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Paola, very much for this very excellent, clear, and informative lecture on the molecule formation. So... Please, everybody, ask your question in chat. And we will start now with uh, a few questions which already appeared during the lecture. So the first question was, are the CO formation and removal reaction in gas phase or on surface, like amorphous ice? Okay, okay, yeah, this is a, a good, very good question. So I hear what I have shown is the formation of CO in the gas phase. Uh, and I can go back here to this uh, slide that in fact, we said that we need uh, to start the chemistry in these molecular clouds. We need the dust because you need to form a first H2, but then the CO is mainly formed in the gas phase through very simple reactions that require the formation of, uh, um, let me, uh, here, this is probably clearer, the formation of H3+, plus that then uh, reacts with carbon, and then goes all the way to CO through this uh, series of abstraction reaction and then dissociative recombination. So it's a gas phase. I have been talking mostly, so here exclusively about the formation of CO in the gas phase. Okay, thank you. So the next question, I do not completely understand, but I hope you will. <laughs> what are the blue and red wings in terms of spectra? Is it as simple as blue corresponding to shorter wavelengths and red corresponding to longer ones, or is it something else? Aha, uh -huh. yes. So this is probably refers to, yes. So to this uh, profile here that I showed. So this is, uh, in fact, here there is velocity. And so this is, uh, say, uh, when we have a, a small velocities, we talk about, uh, so basically you have a, a approaching, you like in the Doppler effect. So you have approaching uh, motion, so motions, uh, material that comes toward you. This will have a blue shifted, we call it blue shifted, so a shorter velocity uh, compared to, um, say the, the line of sight, uh, the standard of rest uh, velocity of the, of the source, while red is actually material that is moving farther away from you. 
okay? So here the velocity is increasing and the frequency is, uh, say, the reverse uh, in this case of the, of the velocity, just following the, the Doppler effect. So the blue emission comes from the back of the cloud that is contracting, and this is coming toward us. The red is uh, the material of the cloud that is in front of us, and it is contracting, but it is moving uh, toward the center, so it is going away from us. I hope yes. it's <laughs> Yes, yes, thank you. So the next question, in terms of Oops. In terms of the history of science, will the discovery of new space telescopes and missions allow us to speak of a new era in astrochemistry or even scientific revolution in chemistry? Aha. Uh -huh. So, well, I would say that um, now with JWST, we will definitely we are definitely entering a new era because uh, we have, uh, in fact, that we can go deeper into the uh, composition of the ice that ices that are actually seen in these dark regions, but also in protoplanetary disks. So these are the say precursors to the formation of planetesimals and then planets. So it's really, this is, I think, is going to be fundamental and uh, it's so important because the surface chemistry is one of the most, uh, say, uncertain parts of our modeling. So we need uh, very good constraints uh, to that. From the point of view of new discoveries of molecules, I could actually point my finger <laughs> tower in the direction of, uh, for example, the Green Bank Telescope and also the Yebes Telescope. They have been uh, really amazing in the past years uh, to discover new molecules. So, so these telescopes uh, actually, uh, like JWST, they are uh, observing at low frequencies. And in low frequencies, it, this is where you have large organics uh, that uh, can be discovered. And in fact, for example, Brett McGuire discovered the first PAH, so the first polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, this uh, benzene with the CN attached, and more and more of these uh, aromatic uh, uh, compounds have been discovered also by the group led by Pepe Cernicharo in Spain. So you need um, new instruments uh, to say, uh, of course, uh, to open new windows and have more sensitive observations, but also with in our say, for example, uh, the low radio wavelength regime that is easily accessible from Earth, you can actually build very sensitive receivers and actually do an amazing job to discover new species. And you you can see that uh, I don't know if you are familiar with. Uh, the rate of discovery of new molecules in the past, uh, uh, say, few years, there have been an exponential increase uh, thanks to the sensitivity of the MS telescope in Spain and, and the Green Bank telescope uh, in the States. Okay, thank you. So the next question, what is the difference in the order of magnitude of the rate of H2 formation when pHs are present in diffuse clouds. Ah, okay. So yes. So I go back uh, to my um, one of my first uh, here. So yes. So if we do not take into account the pHs and we are just considering the say what we call it the MRM distribution of dust grains. So this is the Mathis Rumpel Nordic paper, 1977, where they show this distribution of dust grains in the interstellar medium that they deduce from the extinction curve, blah, blah, blah. So if you just take into account these dust grains, you get this number, okay? So this you have like 10 to the minus 17 per cubic centimeter per second. Now, if you take into account pHs, which it's not obvious that they are everywhere, but we see them very well nearby massive star forming regions because they are illuminated by the massive stars. So then you see them in emission. Uh, they are like large molecules, in fact. So in these regions, as Habart et al. Uh, showed, 
the formation rate of H2 can be higher by an order of magnitude. So this was the 10 to the minus 16. Sorry if it was not uh, so clear. So, 10 to the, so it could be like uh, the rate of formation of H2 can be enhanced by an order of magnitude to compare to what you have if you don't take into account uh, um, pHs. And this is because pHs have a very large surface area being very small, and you can produce H2 on their surfaces uh, relatively easily. So that's why the formation, uh, even if you have a large star that can dissociate your H2, but the production of H2 becomes uh, much higher, so you can actually form H2 copiously uh, there. And in fact, this is what Hubbard and also Boschmann et al. have seen uh, close to PDRs, to these photo dissociation regions. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, I was wondering what is the most abundant home in the interstellar clouds? Hmm. That's very interesting. So I would say that if we take into account the um, uh, the fact, so if we are considering comms as the molecules with at least six atoms in size, I am pretty confident to tell you that the most abundant com is methanol. In fact, if uh, we go in, uh, say, tower. Uh, young stellar objects, methanol lines are everywhere. And uh, if you measure the abundance, I mean, it has been measured, the abundance uh, uh, also lo looking into less abundant uh, isotopologues like with the 13C, et cetera, you arrive at uh, fractions that are significant fraction of the CO. So the CO abundance is about 10 to minus four when it is not depleted. Uh, on, the, the, on the dust grains, so you have 10 to the minus 4 compared with respect to H2 molecules. Methanol can get as high as 10 to the minus 5, so you know, a significant fraction of CO uh, is found to be converted into, into the methanol. So I would say that methanol is the most abundant com, and then from there, there is a cascade of uh, reaction that can bring... So the next, uh, for example, for the oxygen-bearing species, the next... Uh, uh, most abundant could be, uh, but this I, you know, I should check, but I just intuitively it could be the acetaldehyde that is the one step away from, from the methanol. And then uh, you have methyl formate that is also very abundant. And then for the nitrogen, it, it, uh, you have uh, like... Um, the uh, ethyl cyanide, so this is the fully hydrogenated uh, CN type of uh, uh, species, so CH3, CH2, CN. And, uh, and also it depends where you look, because, for example, in uh, very energetic uh, regions where you have uh, dust temperatures that can exceed, uh, say, 100 Kelvin or more, you start to see also molecules that are more refractory, like uh, for formamide. So this is uh, a, a molecule that is very important, actually, as a prebiotic molecule. But you don't see it everywhere because most of the time it resides on the ice, is frozen into the ice. We don't know if it is form it's probably forming the gas phase and then frozen up. But so going back to your question, to be short, I would say methanol. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, could you please speak about the formation of pHs? Where and how are those cones are formed? Oh, this is such a difficult question. <laughs> So yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a very important question actually because uh, now we see, um, for example, just again uh, taking into account all the work that has been done uh, with the Yebes telescope by Pepe Chernisharo and collaborators, and also Brett McGuire and collaborators at GBT. So they have been observing these aromatic species in dark clouds. So, so this is the famous TMC1. This is uh, a region of the Taurus molecular cloud where there is no star formation going on. So the claim, as far as I understand, is that these species are actually formed locally. So from a, a bottom-up 
um, reaction. So starting from simple species, hydrocarbon, and then you form these aromatics uh, in, in the gas phase locally. Of course, uh, you have formation of pHs also in, uh, <clears throat> say, in the atmosphere of, uh, more, of carbon rich starts, because there you have uh, enough Temp so the temperature is high enough, the density is high enough that you can actually, uh, and if the carbon to oxygen ratio is, uh, say, relatively large, so in this case, in cases of these carbon rich starts, so you could have atmospheres where the C over O ratio is larger than one, then in this condition, you can also start to form uh, chains uh, and then, uh, say, probably form, form uh, uh, <clears throat> form structures that, that can end up into aromatics and pHs. Now, I think uh, this is not solved, this question yet. Uh, it's uh, still, uh, people are still working on that. If you are interested in this, I would suggest uh, to look into the, for example, the Alexander Thielen's book, uh, the interstellar meal where Alexander Tielens is one of the say person who have spent uh, really many years in under trying to understand the, the physics and chemistry of pHs. But so it's still an open question, and uh, it's I'll be also very curious to know exactly how how it goes. And I want to tell you one more thing is that in these clouds, so in the dark clouds where um, say. Uh, Chernishkaro and collaborators, etc., are claiming that uh, the production is local. I have a problem with that because uh, in these regions you have to have uh, C over O ratios that are larger than one. And it's not clear for me how you can actually get rid of the oxygen to uh, be able to produce uh, these, uh, these aromatics. So this is uh, still uh, uh, a big uh, open question. So thanks for the for the question. It's it's very important. Thank you. So the next question is the formation of uh, CO molecules from the collisions of OH and carbon atoms possible? OH plus carbon atoms. OH plus carbon atoms. So this is, uh, I mean, uh, is on the, um, you're talking about, uh, I presume, a gas phase. So this is uh, a, a neutral neutral reaction. And I, I need to check because you see from what I said at the beginning. So let me go back to the slide with this, uh, this type of thing. So, Let's see, it's not in here, but so what we have to do, we have to, to look into the dissociation energy of OH and the dissociation energy of CO. So the dissociation energy of CO, I think the bond, the bond is stronger for CO because you have a triple bond and that the OH is only one bond. So it should be energetically favorable. But uh, it's uh, it's maybe you know it's it's a slower process compared to uh, the the process that I show you before, starting from the H three plus. So it's something that I need to look at the numbers to to make sure what I'm saying is correct. But uh, so if you start, for example, in diffuse clouds, okay, in diffuse clouds, carbon is mostly in C plus. So this should be a reaction mostly in a dark region. And in dark region, I have the uh, impression, again, this is just intuition, it's not quantitative work here, is that if you have carbon, the most important reaction will be with the H3 plus. And so faster compared to this one. This could have uh, an importance, but uh, relatively speaking, I think the C plus C, uh, H3 plus will be, say, faster to form uh, CO than uh, this neutral neutral reaction. But if you want, I mean, uh, you can send me an email and we can look into this more accurately uh, because I cannot remember all the rates, but uh, yeah, this is my intuition. So it could go ahead, but it will not be important uh, as uh, C plus H3 plus, and then followed by the uh, CH3 plus plus oxygen, uh, which is an ion neutral reaction at the end of the cascade. Okay, thank you. 
So the next question, does this way of synthesis of amino acid have the same stereoselectivity as, as it is seen on amino acids on living beings? Aha, uh -huh. yeah, this is also a very interesting Almost question. Almost all of them of the L type. Right, yes, so actually, uh, as far as I know, the, there is no um, concluding, ev concluding evidence, conclusive evidence that the amino acids that have been uh, found in meteoritic material are either, you know, there is an excess of uh, left-handed or an excess of right-handed. Uh, there have been some claims, but it's not obvious. Uh, to me that this is uh, the case. Uh, there is no one paper that I can say, say okay, yes, they are mostly left-handed and this is what we need for life. However, I found I find this point um, not super important. In, not your question. Your question is very important, but the point of not having a, a left-handed or right-handed excess in meteoritic material, for example, I don't think it's important for the origins of life. And the reason for this is that once you start uh, using a certain um, say con uh, conformation, so in this case, either left-handed or right-handed, it's really hard to mix up the two. So assume that you start with the racemic mixture. So you have 50-50, left-handed or right-handed. And assume that uh, during the process of, uh, in these early phases of formation of uh, uh, life, so we are back here in the early earth, you, you start to make a lot of molecules, lots of complex organics, uh, but then one will be more successful than the other. In our case, it was the left-handed amino acid. There is no way that you can actually mix up the two. So basically, it's just a 50-50 chance. Do we start with left-handed or right-handed? Well, in our case, we started with left-handed, and then we proceed with the left-handed. And think that the uh, sugars that are in the backbone, they are right-handed. So I think it's more like the energetics that are needed for the formation of the prebiotic molecules that are driving the excess in living forms more than uh, you know the very beginning uh, so these um, uh, these prebiotic molecules that we find in meteoritic material but this is my point of view i cannot prove it <laughs> because i didn't do myself these calculations that are shown uh, here uh, so it could be actually very interesting to ask uh, people uh, in this uh, team uh, about uh, about this point. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. The next question. Could you please clarify the distinguishment between thermal chemistry and radiochemistry? When is the radiochemistry... Uh, Radio, when is the ra radiochemistry more important? In other words, when can one take the energy of photons for input of chemical reaction? Okay, let's see. I think I need the two. Uh, so I, 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 I think that, so the question is, uh, when is the thermal, for example, I, I, I'm assuming here, but maybe I'm wrong. Are we talking about surface chemistry or uh, say gas phase chemistry? Um, because okay, so let let me say it in this way. So I do I do both both cases. So let's assume that the question is on gas phase. So radiation chemistry. So by radiation now in this case I assume we are talking about, uh, for example, uh, um, photons. So photochemistry uh, is important at the edge of molecular clouds that are exposed to the interstellar radiation field. So now the extinction, the visual extinction, that is basically it's uh, a measure of the column of the dust that uh, you have from, say, the edge of the cloud to the center of the cloud. Um, the extinction is very important because uh, the extinction of this radiation is, a, a, is basically an exponential path 
factor with the extinction. So as you go deeper inside the cloud, the photons are basically extincted, and then, then you are left with the dark chemistry, you know, dark cloud chemistry inside. So the edge of the clouds can be considered as a photo dissociation region, photon dominated region, where you have photochemistry, radiation chemistry. If we are talking about surface, so again, this what I just said, it also applies to the, say, edge of the cloud. You have more radiation, so you can have photochemistry, you can have dissociation of the molecules, formation of more complex molecules, but you can also have a photodesorption. So you are actually, you are in a regime where the ice is thin in this outer part. However, in the inner part of the clouds, where there are no photons, so you, we still have these cosmic rays, you know? And this is the other form of radiation that, that uh, we, we are talking about. So I, to do this, I put up this slide again. So radiation chemistry becomes important in, in these particular models uh, that I've been uh, talking about from Chris Schindler-Decker and collaborators, becomes important in very dark regions where you can actually accumulate ice, and then you let the cosmic rays go through, and these cosmic rays can actually, uh, as it shows here in this, in this figure, can actually uh, produce, uh, allow, say, the production of more molecules uh, or more complex molecules because they can break the bond, like in this case, from H2O, you go to OH. OH is very reactive and it can actually produce uh, more complex species. So radiation chemistry is important when we talk about cosmic rays in dark and dense region of molecular clouds. If we are talking about uh, irradiation, let's say from uh, photons, et cetera, we are talking about the edge of the clouds or regions that are nearby stars, which could be also young stars along the outflows of young stars or you know, nearby in the, in the, this protoplanetary disk that are close by uh, or on the surface of protoplanetary disk. So yeah, sorry, it was not clear to me exactly, but I hope it is with these two, uh, I answer your question. If I didn't, feel free to send me an email. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So we have another question. Uh, does the possibility of the C plus OH reaction to form CO depends on its rate, if it is to be included in the chemical model? Okay, so this uh, we are talking about uh, uh, C plus plus OH, you said. Mm -hmm. C plus OH yes. producing CO, yeah. Yes, yes. So in a, in the chemical model, uh, yes, definitely. So you need to know the rate. You need to, to know the rate coefficient. And uh, this, uh, uh, this, in fact, is a little bit of the problem in these big chemical networks uh, because, uh, yeah, several of these rates have been measured, but not definitely not all. I'm not sure about these specific molecules. I need to check uh, the, you know, one way to check is to look into one of these. Uh, um, so the main databases for reaction is the KIDA database. Uh, so this is Valentin Wakelam uh, and uh, other people in uh, Bordeaux that are maintaining this uh, uh, database. But there is also the UMIST uh, database that where you can actually just connect online uh, to the database, uh, uh, write the, uh, the reaction, and then they provide information about the rate, not just the number, but they also provide information about if the rate has been measured and if it is measured in which range of temperatures. And this is also very important because sometimes uh, and in general, these rates are measured, for example, at room temperature. So then uh, people are typically extrapolating to low temperature and this could be, of course, a problem because, as we have seen, also in the case of neutral neutral reaction, the rates can be very different if you go to low temperature and high temperature. This is an ion molecule reaction, so this should be, uh, say, um, in this condition where the temperature is not important because, as I mentioned, in the case of uh, this is the 
uh, slide that, that I mentioned, the ion molecule reaction, they should be, uh, say, relatively independent of the temperature because of the um, polarizability of the OH uh, uh, molecule. So, uh, but of course, you need to know these, uh, these rates uh, relatively accurately because, of course, when you put these plugged in, in into a chemical model, if you have a larger error bar in a rate, then, of course, this will propagate for uh, uh, in, in other abundances of other species. And it, of course, that's what is making astrochemical modeling. Uh, uh, uncertain. So we, we, and this is why uh, us astrochemists uh, are always in very close contact with, uh, say, experimentalists and also theoreticians that allow us uh, to refine these, uh, these numbers as, uh, the best we can. Okay, thank you. So our time is almost over, but I still want to ask at the end uh, a question sure. about S8. Uh, S8, so yes. you, you said that it uh, could be expected to be present in the solid state, but was it also detected in the gas phase? And if not, uh, why not? Right, yes. So S8 has not been detected in the gas phase. So this is uh, because it's, uh, um, so th there is no dipole moment here. So, and it is uh, uh, very hard, uh, say, to detect uh, in the, say, is in absorption, say, in the, in the, in the infrared. So, the, but we have a hope, uh, and the hope is given by these uh, uh, pieces of S8. So we could be able to, say, detect uh, some of these, uh, uh, say, derived, uh, say, assuming that you have some photo dissociation, or for example, if you are in a region where you are exposed to UV and uh, you can actually, like in the case of the comet, where in fact these species have been detected, uh, you can have uh, pieces of these, um, uh, say, allotropes of, um, of sulfur back in the gas phase, and then you can have some chemistry in the gas phase, and this could give you some indirect evidence of the presence of, uh, of S8. Yeah, unfortunately, this is, uh, this is a problem, but in a sense, I'll, I have to say, help us to understand uh, this uh, sulfur problem, because given that this is like a dark uh, sulfur, no? you put the sulfur in this form that it's uh, basically impossible to detect and then uh, it's it's just in a dark form and uh, it could be actually a large repository of of uh, of sulfur that could solve this problem of why we need to reduce the sulfur abundance in our chemical model by three orders of magnitude compared to the cosmic abundance when we look at the chemistry in dark clouds besides it's very refractory so it could actually become uh, a, how to say part of the uh, refractory material of the of the dust that in in these uh, in these regions, which it's interesting and it could be actually interesting to um, say go deeper in this analysis of the comet, uh, uh, especially the dust uh, the dust uh, dust grains that have been uh, studied uh, coming from the comet the sixty seven p to see if there is evidence of these uh, uh, sulfur uh, allotropes, or also maybe in um, the recent uh, uh, missions that took back uh, material from uh, these uh, old, uh, say, primitive asteroids that have been uh, uh, visited. So this was Bennu and Ryugu. And so hopefully there will be some uh, more work done to look into the presence of sulfur in this, in this uh, uh, primitive material in our solar system. But it's very hard to, yeah, very hard to, to detect. Yeah, I see. I see. Okay, thank you very much. Thank um, you. Yeah, I I think our time is now over, but uh, everybody who still have questions could uh, ask a question in Slack or send uh, an email to Paola.
and yeah, continue as a discussion. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, perfect. I thank you all uh, very much. Thank you, Segi, and uh, this is very nice, very good questions. So thank you all. So still a lot of work to do in astrochemistry. <laughs> yes. All the best. Yes. Bye. Yes. Thank you and bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.